Good afternoon, everyone. We're very happy to have this uh, uh, today's uh, version of the quantum colloquium by Fang Fu from the University of South Carolina, who's going to tell us about um, proto uh, quipper with dynamic lifting. Please, Frank. Hi, right, thank you. Uh, well, I, I suppose I should say good evening, everyone, but uh, <laughs> but it's morning here. Um, yeah, so thanks for the invitation. Uh, so uh, I am going to talk about uh, Portal Creeper with Dynamic Lifting. Uh, it's a joint work with my co-authors, uh, Kohei Kishida, Neil Julian Rose, and Peter Sanger. So uh, first of all, I'd like to give a bit of a background on uh, the programming language Creeper. So Creeper is a, a quantum circuit description language. Uh, it's, it's embedded in Haskell. Uh, specifically, it's available as a library, uh, as a Haskell library. So uh, the idea is that uh, it, a programmer can write functions uh, in Creeper and those functions uh, corresponds to a uh, quantum circuit. So uh, so programmer will be able to uh, use Creeper to generate quantum circuits and some of those circuits are quite large. So uh, Creeper has uh, several features. Uh, the first one is that uh, it supports uh, this kind of high level quantum circuit operations. So a lot of the time, uh, when we generate a quantum circuit, uh, it's it's not the last step, right? So sometimes we want to do a uh, gate count on how many gates that a quantum circuit used, or we want to perform some other operations, like uh, we want to control the quantum circuit so that uh, the control is one, then the quantum circuit is fired. Otherwise, uh, it performs the identity operation. Uh, and also sometimes we want to sort of transform uh, a circuit into a more efficient circuit and things like that. So uh, so the idea of, uh, so, so Creeper has this notion of uh, circuit data structure that, uh, that supports this kind of high level operations. So uh, so the the assumption that uh, Creeper makes uh, in terms of uh, how to interact with uh, quantum computer is uh, through this uh, the so-called QRAM uh, architecture, but uh, but roughly it's like, uh, on the one hand, we have uh, some kind of a classical computer, and on the other hand, we have a quantum computer, and uh, and Creeper is sort of the language Creeper is in the classical computer side, and it once it generates a circuit, then it sends the circuits to the classical sorry to the quantum computer, and and then the quantum computer will sort of execute the uh, quantum circuits gate by gate. And then uh, after the uh, processing is done and the quantum computer perform measurements and send back the result. So uh, so this is really some kind, it, it's really a kind of a batch processing. So uh, the classical computer, the idea is that the classical computer will send uh, the entire quantum circuits to the uh, to the quantum computer so that the quantum computer can processing them all and then send back the results. So uh, so this means that uh, the Creeper language uh, have uh, two kinds of runtimes, right? So uh, the first runtime, uh, we will call it uh, circuit generation time. Uh, it's, it's for, it's, it's for classical computer to generate quantum circuit, right? Right, and the other uh, runtime which we call 
circuit execution time, which uh, is the runtime for of the quantum computer. So, so that's basically the setup of the runtimes for Creeper. And uh, I guess one last, last but not least, uh, Creeper allow these two runtimes to interleave uh, via a, a concept called dynamic lifting, which will be the topic of this talk. Um, but roughly the idea is that uh, sometimes we want the, uh, when, when the quantum computer is processing a list of gate, sometimes we want to only measure uh, parts of the qubit and then, uh, and then send the result to the classical computer. At the same time, the quantum computer still maintains some the, the remaining qubits so that uh, when, uh, or, or in some sense, the quantum computer is waiting for the, the feedback from the classical computer to further uh, processing the information. But uh, I will I will talk more about this uh, dynamic lifting in 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 the next slide. Okay, so uh, that's that's Creeper. Uh, so it's a library it's in Haskell and it supports a lot of useful stuff that one can do with quantum circuit. And then uh, and then we have another families of languages uh, which we call Proto Creeper. Uh, the idea is that. Uh, it it aims to provide formal foundations for for various features of Creeper. Uh, by that I mean, uh, each version of Proto Creeper it should come with a formal description of the tie system, uh, and also the form a formal description of the operational semantics. Uh, specifying how uh, one should run the proto creeper programs and also uh, categorical semantics, namely uh, what is the meaning of the Thai system interpreted in terms of the uh, category theory. So uh, so there has been uh, uh, several developments uh, along the line of this uh, proto creeper. Uh, the first version uh, of Protocreeper is called Protocreeper M. Uh, it's by Rio and Selinger in 2018. It's the one that came with uh, a linear type system and a uh, and a description of operational semantics and also a very nice categorical model. And then uh, later on, uh, Later on, Kishida, Selinger, and I, we uh, we added the dependent type into the proto Creeper M, and uh, there we we sort of get a notion of linear dependent type, but it's fairly, uh, yeah. So that's that's the the one direction of the extension for proto Creeper M. Uh, so last year also, uh, we also looking at how to extend Proto Creeper M with, with this dynamic lifting, which allows co in interleaving the two run times that I was talking about earlier. And uh, this, we, we, we managed to come up with a formal type system and operational semantics and, and even uh, categorical semantics. So uh, this will be what, uh, I will talk more about in this talk. Okay. Um, so uh, before I, I talk more about the dynamic lifting and formal stuff, uh, I, I will just like to quickly show you uh, what a uh, typical uh, proto creeper programs looks like and uh, what it does, right? So for example, here we have a examples of proto creeper program uh, is uh, here we have this function called which we call teleportation function uh, there are uh, some notation here which is 
the bank notation here, which is not important right now, but uh, this tally is is at the program uh, protocryper language. It can be described as a function that takes a qubit as input and outputs a qubit. And the way we define this tally function uh, is that uh, we 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 call some build uh, belt function, which prepared a belt state, which is a two qubit state. So we get a belt pair A and B, and then uh, and then we sort of split the belt states into two. One is given to Alice, and Alice will take the input qubit together with this uh, variable A and perform a belt measurement, and then we will get X and Y, so X and Y here are actually classical bits, and then uh, and then that information will then be passed to the Bob function, which uh, will perform uh, corrections based on the receiving bits value X and Y, and then we get the we sort and then Bob reconstruct the quantum state, which denoted by Z. So that's that's roughly this teleportation. Uh, circuit uh, uh, can be described in Proto Creeper. So, so this tally is a function, but uh, but if one of the features of uh, Proto Creeper is that we can turn this kind of function like tally into actual quantum circuit. So, uh, the construct for doing that in uh, in Proto Creeper is called box. So, box takes a uh, a type which is the input type of the uh, of the function that it is boxing, and then the function itself. So box takes a qubit and a tally the tally function as input, and then uh, and then it gives us a circuit with input qubits and output qubit. So uh, so when we run this uh, box tally in in an interpreter. Uh, we can actually see this is the circuits that correspond to the teleportation function. So uh, roughly we can sort of spot that this part is like the bell preparations of the bell states. And then here is the input states. And then here is the Alice or the bell measurement. And then here is the correction based on the classical information. And here is the this output wire is the uh, output qubit. So that's roughly the uh, usually uh, what programming in Proto Creeper would look like and in, in Creeper as well. Um, so uh, so next I'd like to talk about like the two run times uh, of Proto Creeper. So we already seen that uh, we programmer write some can write uh functions that correspond to quantum circuit and then uh and then we have our first run time which we call circuit generation time uh so it takes a proto creeper program and it generates quantum circuit right so this circuit generation time is done uh it's sort of implemented can be implemented entirely in a classical computer. So uh, yeah, so in other words, we, we don't really need quantum computer to generate quantum circuits. So classical computer is, uh, is good enough for generating quantum circuit. And then once we generate uh, the quantum circuit, we can then uh, send the circuits to actual quantum computer or simulator and uh, to to execute the circuit, right? So that part we the so that's the second runtime which, uh, which we call circuit uh, execution time. Uh, so this the sec this second runtime has to be done by actual quantum computer or simulator, uh, because it actually involves uh, executing the quantum circuit uh, gate by gate. Um, so. So there are values in in the two run time, right? So for example, in the circuit generation time, we have values like natural number, Boolean. Uh, so those values, we call them parameters. So we think of them as 
uh, as parameters of the circuit, right? So they uh, once those value are known at uh, circuit generation time, we can then generate a circuit with fixed size or uh, with a with, uh, fixed length or size. So for example, uh, uh, the, the teleportation uh, circuits is one example. We always know how many gates or how many qubit does the uh, teleportation uh, circuit need. And so, so the the numbers of qubit we, it can be think of as a a kind of a parameter parameters. Uh, right. So so those values are known at uh, circuit generation time. In other words, we need to know how many qubits uh, this uh, a circuit need in order to generate the circuit. So so this this makes sense. Uh. Whereas in the circuit execution time, we also have uh, a notion of values, which which we call uh, state. So so the values there are are more like resource, right? They are like uh, actual qubits uh, or bits in the register and things like that. So so for example. So those values can only be known in the circuit execution time, right? Because we don't really know the state of a qubit unless we we uh we initialize a qubit or we we perform some operations on a qubit. So so those bits and qubits are very typical examples of the value that are known in the circuit execution time. So they are called states. So uh, here I want to mention that a measurement in 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 this case is actually like a gate, right? So it's it's an operation as well, but it it transforms the state qubits into into the state bit. Okay, so uh, so that's measurement, whereas uh, that is in contrast to this operation, which we call dynamic lifting, uh, which lifts the bit state to a Boolean parameter, right? So, so there is a distinction between qubit, bit, and bool. So bool is a parameter that lives in the uh, circuit generation time. Uh, so a lot of the time, it's sort of natural to assume that a state can depend on parameters in the sense that uh, if, if we know the value of a parameters, we can correspondingly generate a circuit based on that parameter. And a, a, another example of that would be initializing a qubit into the zero state or the one state depending on the parameter bool, right? So if if the input parameter is true, we can initialize the qubits into the one state by inserting uh, a initialization gates uh, that initialize qubits in one state or zero state if the input parameter is false. So, so in that sense, uh, states can depend on parameters. But the other way around is less obvious, right? So what do we mean by when a parameter can depend on states? So it's less clear, but but with this operation, with, with this uh, dynamic lifting operation, we are effectively allow the other way around. We are sort of allowed to convert a state into the parameter so that we can furthermore use this parameter to generate new circuits. So that's uh, that's uh, one aspect of this uh, dynamic lifting operation. So, uh, so uh, graphically, well, or, or schematically, uh, this arrow that takes a uh, we can visualize this dynamic lifting as a some kind of an operation that lifts the state bit in the circuit runtime to uh, to the circuit generation time. Okay, uh, 
I, I want to briefly pause to ask if we have any questions so far. It seems no questions. So okay, good. sounds good. Okay, so let's carry on. Um, right, so, um, so now I want to briefly talk about why do we need such of an operation like dynamic lifting. Uh, first of all, the reason uh, that this operation is useful is that it, uh, it actually allow us to interleave the two round terms. Uh, in a more practical sense, the, uh, the benefits of having an operation like that in a circuit description language is that it gives us ability to uh, describe more quantum algorithms. So there are algorithms that that sort of generate the circuit dynamically based on the measurement outcome. Uh, so there are a range of algorithms are like that. So so having this dynamically dynamic lifting operation will allow us to uh, program those algorithms in uh, in protocreeper. And uh, another benefit of uh, added this dynamic lifting is that because uh, it's an operation that lift a wrong a circuit wrong time or circuit execution time value to a circuit generation time value. So this means that uh, in our language, we will need to specify the operational semantics for the uh, circuit execution term, as well as the operational semantics for the circuit generation term. So this means that to give an Im implementation that supports dynamic lifting, we will, we will need to incorporate uh, not only the the backend for generating circuits, but also the quantum backend that uh, is responsible for uh, actually executing the quantum gate. So this means that, well, in, in our case, we can always uh, use a simulator instead of an actual quantum computer. That means that uh, we can we we can even test some simple quantum circuits uh, with the help of uh, dynamic lifting. Uh, so that's uh, the motivation for dynamic lifting. Now we want to delve more into the technical aspects of the language. Uh, so we uh, so here I want to describe the type system that uh, we use to. Uh, to enable, uh, to enable dynamic lifting or, uh, so the type system we designed features uh, a notion of modality. So uh, a modality in our type system is denoted by this Greek letter alpha. Uh, so it, it has uh, either a values of zero or one where the, the meaning of zero and one is really like the following. So one means that uh, computations uh, correspond to a notion of boxable circuit, whereas zero means that uh, a computation that uses dynamic lifting. So these two are, yeah, so that's, that's the intended meaning of zero and one. Uh, and then we, uh, we attach types with this modality alpha. So the types in protocreeper roughly, uh, so here is a, a rough description of the types in protocreeper. So uh, we have the usual types like bits, qubits, and uh, tensor of two types, and the circuit type from S and U, where S and U are basically a tensor product of qubits or bits. Uh, but the more important thing is that not only we have the usual linear function type, but we also add a modality to the linear function type. So this means that if we have, when, when this alpha is one, this could mean that uh, we have a, a circuit generating 
function that can be boxed into a circuit. But uh, but when this alpha is zero, it means that we have a computation that might use dynamic lifting, right? In that case, the computation does not correspond to a quantum circuit, right? So here by quantum circuit, I mean a circuit that has a fixed size of inputs and a fixed length. So it's like a fixed circuit, but if if uh if a function or a computation that use dynamic lifting, uh, then it's not necessarily the case that it calls the computation correspond to a fixed quantum circuit anymore. And similarly for this bank, we, we also have this exclamation mark, which we call bank of type A. And it also gets annotated with a modality zero and one. Um, so this bank is more related to boxability, like if we want to box a computation into a circuit type, we will need this uh, bank type in order to box a computation into the circuit. Uh, right, so that's that's the modification that we made on uh, in the type. So all we so if we just erase the modality here, the type is essentially the same as. Uh, uh, the types in protocrypto M. Um, we we also add the modality description to the typing judgment. Um, so so when we say a term M has type A in the environment gamma, we can write gamma turns out uh, alpha M of A, right? So so again, this indicates that. Uh, the the modality alpha here indicates that uh the the program n uh use or or well let me let me rephrase it uh when when alpha is one it indicates that uh the program n when we evaluate the program n it does not invoke the dynamic lifting operation whereas when alpha has the value zero then it means that when we evaluate the expression n, we will need to uh we we will likely need to use the uh dynamic lifting uh operation. So that's the overall uh modification of the types and the typing judgment. So they are all decorated with this modality, and then uh, and then the idea is that we can then specify the typing judgment uh, in a way that track the modality, right? So for example, for the dynamic lifting operation, um, it, if we have a term M that has type bit, then we, we have this dynamic lifting operation that lifts the bit value into uh, uh, an expression that has type bool. And the same at the same time, it also sets the current modality to zero. So this means that the computation actually require dynamic lifting. In this case, it is because dynamic lift of n, in order to evaluate this expression, we will the operational semantic will need to evaluate dynamic lifting. So that's why uh, it has modality zero here. And uh, But on the other hand, if we want to box a computation into a circuit, we will need to require modality one. So specifically, uh, this uh, is uh, represented in this typing rule. Um, so if we have a computation of M and the M has the type uh, bang subscript one as arrow U, which also have subscript one, uh, then, then in that case, the value of N correspond to a circuit, right? So 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 in that case, we, we can say, oh, then, then we can box this expression M into a circuit with input S and output U. So uh, so that's how we 
make the so that's how we use type system to make the distinction between computation that are corresponding to circuit versus computation that does not correspond to circuit. Uh, so uh, so for the other typing rule are uh, relatively standard in terms of how to check uh, the modality. For example, uh, for the lambda term, uh, because uh, we are, I mean, because a lambda term is a value. So the uh, the evaluation of a value, uh, a value cannot be further evaluated. So therefore uh, a lambda term has modality one. And, but, uh, but the term n might originally have some other modality, which is alpha. Uh, and that modality will then uh, get transferred to the type. Uh, in this case, the alpha becomes a modality in the type. So, so that when we apply this lambda expression to some other argument, then the modality of n will, uh, will play a role in the evaluation. So for example, uh, that's what this uh, uh, typing rule for application is for, right? So, uh, if, if M is a function from A to B that has modality alpha two, and then when we apply M to N of type A, the modality will be a Boolean conjunction of alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. So what this means is that in, in a core by value evaluation, uh, when evaluate this expression, we first evaluate M that is where this uh, modality alpha one will play a role. If if this alpha one use dynamic lifting, then that set that means the evaluation will use dynamic lifting, and similarly the the alpha three correspond to the modality of n the argument, and the modality alpha two correspond to the case when m is evaluated to a lambda expression. And then we perform the substitution, and then that is where the alpha two indicates the uh, the modality during the evaluation. So that's uh, that's how we set up the typing rule to keep track of which computation is corresponding to circuits and which computation uh, correspond to the use of dynamic lifting. Uh, so 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 that's that's roughly the typing of the proto creeper with dynamic lifting, and then for operational semantics. Uh, Sorry, Frank, there's a question. Yeah. All right. Before, before could you go back to the previous slide? Sure. Please. Um, Sorry. Uh, you mean this one? Yeah. Do you have a uh, 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 what what structural rules do you have in this type theory? You have weakening and contraction that uh, I noticed that you you don't use the same gamma on the application of the- Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so this type system is it's, it's really a, a kind of a linear typing system, uh, meaning that uh, it does not have weakening for, for uh, for the for the linear variable, uh, yeah. So I, I'm not sure if that makes sense. So so that's why here when we apply m with n, we we sort of so this gamma one and gamma two are we we consider them as linear context, and then when we apply m to n, we we just like concatenate gamma one and gamma two. Um, yeah, so so weakening is taken care of by by this uh, this typing rule in, in a sense. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, I, I think so, thank you. Yeah, uh, of course the story is slightly complicated because we also have parameter context. So in that case, the setup is really in uh like uh 
we 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 can identify certain parts of the context to be parameter. So in that case, those will be handled like a usual intuitionistic way. For so those kind of contexts, uh, we do have weakening and contraction and things like that. But for, is... for actual linear context, we don't. But but yeah, that, that's basically the gist of uh, linear typing, essentially. Is the context like split into parameter and linear portions? Right, or... right. We can always, uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I think I think in this case the contact is it's not so the delta it's out not there. the case that we have uh, a parameter, but more formally, uh, I should write uh, another context here. Let's say phi comma gamma one. So the phi corresponds to the parameter context, and we can also write another phi here comma gamma two, and then here we just keep the phi wrong. All right, great. Thanks. That answers my question. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, that's that's typing, and uh, I wouldn't go into more details about operational semantics, but I want to mention that uh, because we now have two kind of wrong terms, uh, our operational semantics will need to account for both circuit generation time and circuit execution time. So uh, for the circuit generation time is entirely classical and deterministic. So we have the usual pairs of configuration. So here C is a circuit and M is a program. And the idea is that we sort of evaluate the program M which will append circuits or append content gates to the initial circuit C resulting in a new circuit which denoted by C prime and then the final value V. So this evaluation is entirely deterministic and is for generating circuits. There's no non-determinism in generating circuits in protocrypter. But for the circuit execution term, which is responsible for executing the circuit or executing the uh, operation correspond to the content gates. In that case, we do have non-determinism due to measurement and dynamic lifting. Um, so there, we the specification is more is slightly more complicated, but uh, roughly the idea is that uh, we start the initial configuration is a pair of Q and M. So the the capital Q here is the uh, is the state of a quantum computer, or think of them as a list of qubits, uh, for example. And and when we, the idea is that when evaluating this program N, we are actually perform uh, quantum gates or quantum operation that modify the state Q. So in the end, we get a distribution of resulting quantum state QI and each for each i we have a value. So this i is is the index for a distribution of uh, uh of uh of probability. Uh, or uh, in other words, when we evaluate a, a initial configuration of n and q, we get a distrib a a a. a a set of possibility of resulting states and value. And that is represented by this formal sum of formal convex sum of resulting states and resulting value. So uh, an example where this, uh, this uh, probability or this convex sum occur is uh, how we evaluate the dynamic lifting operation, right? So, so when, so here is how we evaluate a dim lift of the term M. Uh, to evaluate this, we first evaluate the term M into a, a Boolean, or oh, sorry, a bit uh, state. So this label L sort of correspond to the pointer that point to a particular location in this Q prime. So we can, because L is, this L is, by by the type discipline, we know that this L has to be have to have the type bit. 
Therefore, we can read this bit information from the register Q prime. Uh, so, so there is a possibility of this bit being zero or one because this bit will be the results of a measurement in in a actual quantum computer. So, therefore, we have depending on the possibility of from the measurement, we will have this. Uh, probability of p1 plus p2, but with uh, the value two and four. So that's that's uh, one place where this we we get this non-determinism uh, when executing the circuit. So yeah, so that's the operational semantics of the language. So uh, in the last ten minutes, I will talk about. Uh, before you go on, sorry, can I ask another question? Yeah. No, no, uh, no so I, I should read this as a sort of end is the quantum status of circuit Q, and it reduces to uh, L, which is the, the, the sort of state of register Q prime, right? Uh, yeah, right, because this okay. M has initially has the type bit, right? Because in order for thin lift of M to well typed, M has to have the type bit. So, right. so the, the value for a type bit has to be a, a label that refer to a, a, Do you have a, semantics a location for this? prime. Do you have a semantics for this? Because I would have a probability distribution over the space of, of this. Yes. Yeah. So I'd have, there would be two numbers, um, uh, P1 and P2. Are those numbers there? Is that what that is? No, the, the actual states will not have the probability, right? So this is more like a possible mistake. Uh, yeah, this this is more like in the description when we actually run the uh run execute the measurement, it will the location will be actually be a zero or one. So right. so in that case, we will we will just get for example, Q1 of two or Q2 of four. So the 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 Q does not check the probability. Right. Uh, I guess, I would, so what, what are P1 and P2? Oh, uh, yeah, so those are like a, uh, like a description of the different possibility of the the value for for the bit register L, so so P one and P two they are real numbers. Uh, they add up to one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they they correspond to the probability of the bit register being one or zero. If if the bit value is one with probability P one, then the evaluation will give us Q1 and 2 with probability P1. So this is a probabilistic, this is a probabilistic in uh, uh, semantics. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's only in a semantic. It's only when we try to specify the semantics. But uh, when we actually run the quantum circuit, we we will only get I one of the You'll get a one of the eight. Great, thank you. So that's uh that's the operational semantics uh yeah uh, so now I will switch gear to uh the the categorical semantics for this uh for this type system um the basic setup here is that we have two categories to model uh the two wrong terms that I mentioned uh both uh, which we call uh, the category M and Q. Um, so the category M is really like a categorical model for quantum circuit, right? So it's like a mon symmetric monoidal. Uh, it has uh, objects like bits and qubits. We have tensor products and uh, the morphism correspond to box and wire, for example, like measurement uh, for, which is can be modeled as a morphism from qubits to bit, and other operations like Hanama gates can be modeled as a morphism from qubits to qubits. 
Uh, so that's that's roughly the category for quantum circuits. So it just uh, symmetric monoidal categories. And uh, on the other hand, for the second round term, which is the uh, circuit execution term, uh, it's also a uh, a symmetric monoidal category, but uh, this category has slightly more structure uh, in the sense that uh, it has a notion of bit and it know that a bit in this uh, category Q uh, is actually a, a co-product of two tensor units. And, uh, and we also assume Q to be enriched with convex space, but uh, what that means is that uh, if we have two morphisms in Q, we can form the convex sum of these two morphisms. So in a sense, this, this enrichment with convex space allow us to model the, the non-determinism aspects of the operational semantics. So that's uh, the category M and Q. And we also assume there is a uh, symmetric monoidal functor J from M to Q. So what that means is that uh, we have to know what each of these operations in M correspond to, I mean, what each of the quantum gates in M correspond in terms of the actual quantum operation. So this J, we, we also sometimes call it interpretation uh, functor. So it tells us how to execute a, a gate, for example. So, uh, so the setup here is that we assume uh, the category M and Q and how to run the quantum gates as given, right? So, and then and then we want to construct a category that allow us to uh, understand what the program or what a term in the type system means. Uh, so for that, we will need to construct a new category, which we call A. And the category A here will have to satisfy certain property in order to, uh, to model dynamic lifting, right? So one, uh, one of the most standard property that uh, this category A has to satisfy is that it has to admit uh, an adjunction or, or in other words, this A first has to be symmetric monoidal and it, it has to be closed as well because we have function type. We, we want this category to be closed. And uh, we also assume we have this linear, nonlinear adjunction between the category of sets and this category A that uh, admit dynamic lifting. So this other junction effectively give us the ability to, uh, to, to box the uh, circuit, uh, in in some in, uh, to model the the operation box in the type system. So that so this this is relatively standard because uh, for protocopper result dynamic lifting, uh, we already require this kind of other junction. Uh, now with, with dynamic lifting, we also need uh, the category A to satisfy two more, at least two more diagram, right? So the first diagram is that uh, we we require the commutativity of this diagram. So uh, in a category A, we we have to have a morphism that allow us to initialize a bit from from a boolean. Uh, parameter, right? So, so this init is the morphism from bool to bit that essentially initialize a bit based on the value of bool. And then we model uh, the dynamic lifting operation as a, as a morphism from bits to T of bool. So here T is a monad that in some sense, it it uh it capture the idea of the non-determinism uh when we uh when we read a value read a bit value, so so therefore this this thin leaves morphism in in a category A will be modeled as a morphism from bits to T of bool, and 
making when we compose in live with this init, we get the the units of this uh from from bool to t of bool. So we get this uh this bool. So in in a sense, if we for example, if we initialize a uh, two to one, and then we lead we immediately uh, sorry, leave. we have a question about t. Okay. What what is t? Oh, a T is a monad that uh on A. So yeah. Which monad? That's what we're asking. Can you just describe oh, it? Uh, uh so here I'm I'm describing here right. I, I'm essentially giving an axiomatization of, of the category. So we are saying we require in order to model dynamic lifting, we need a monad like that. So I'm uh, I I will delay the description of this monad in a moment, but I I will try to describe it if time permits. But but we but, but the idea is that we need a monad such that this monad gives us this commutative diagram and some other nice property in order to model dynamic lifting. So we are sort of defining what it means to be a monad. I mean, what it means to for a monad to be able to model dynamic lifting. So I'm not giving you an actual construction of the monad yet. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so 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 that's this one diagram means, right? So we we have to correctly, and it's actually a fairly important diagram. Uh, we have to correctly model the behavior of dynamic lifting using this monad T. Right. And the second part of, of the diagram is that uh, in order to model dynamic lifting, we also have to have this functor diagram. So again, here the monad tip also played a, a very important role. So here KL subscript T mean the closely category of T, right? So the, the object in this category are objects in A, and the morphism in this category are of the form A arrow T of B, for example. So uh so that thin leaf will be a morphism in, in this category, for example. Anyway, um so 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 this is a community diagram of a functor, meaning that uh we have to have a way to embed the notion of N, embed the category N into the category A, right? Because uh, M denotes, uh, we mentioned that M model the category of quantum circuit. Therefore, whatever category that we construct for A has to also model quantum circuit. So that's why we have an embedding from M to A. And moreover, we also need a way to embed the second wrong time, which is the how which is the category Q into A in a way, right? So the way we embed that is that it has to be a embedding from Q to the closely category of T. And then and then so so that's what this top arrow and the bottom arrows are. They are embedding. And then the from and then we have the in the interpretation functor J from M to Q indicating how we execute a quantum gate. And on the right, we have the usual usual functor from A to the closely category of T, right? So the functor just uh, take each morph uh, in a, at a morph, for the morphism, it, it takes a morphism in A and then it just uh, post compose with the units of the monad. So, so that's the, so these two diagrams are essentially how we require what or how we use uh, to model dynamic lifting. Uh, so so let's see. So so in the with, with this assumption, we can then interpret the modality using our monad t, right? So then uh, then when alpha is zero, it corresponds to the use of this monad T if alpha is, because that modality zero indicates that a dynamic lifting occurs. So dynamic lifting is 
in some sense model by this monad t. Whereas when alpha is one, it means that absence of dynamic lifting, which is essentially identity monad or does not perform the monad t. So, so with this setup of category that I was talking about, uh, then the the type uh, bang subscript alpha of A will be interpreted by this uh, this co-monad of P after flat, and then this alpha is either T or identity functor on the interpretation of A. And similarly for the arrow, we also interpreted it as a exponential in, in the category. So here we have an exponential, but then uh, depending on the value of this alpha, we might have a T here or not, right? And then the and then as a result for, for a typing judgment like Gamerton style zero MA, it will become a, a monad in the, so it will become the morphism in the Claysley category. So it will be uh, from gamma to T of A, right? That's this T model dynamic lifting. Whereas if we have gamma one and A, it will just be an ordinary morphism from gamma to A. So that's that's the setup of the uh, of this uh, category. Um, but of course, I I need to mention how to construct an actual categories that give us this monad, right? Um, I don't know if I have enough <laughs> to talk about that. Um. But we do have a construction uh, that uh, give us the ability to construct the actual monad T and, and the actual category A such that it satisfy this, uh, this, this two diagrams, for example. So uh, I believe I'm about out of time, right, <laughs> Um, no, we can have a few minutes to finish this. If you okay, want to yeah, I'll, I'll just try to wrap up uh, in a few minutes. But yeah, um, right. So so previously, I give you the description of what we mean by a category that is a model for dynamic lifting, right? So it has to satisfy this two diagram among many other things, and then uh, and then we actually have a way to construct uh, that category A and construct the, mo uh, the monad T. And it used a notion we call biset enrichment, uh, but for the time being, uh, it's essentially like uh, the category of arrow, right? Each object is, a, is an arrow from, from X1 to X0, where X1 and X0 are set and F is a function. And then morphism are uh, commutative square. And then in, in this category, which is set to two of, it has a monad that T where it can, it takes a object and give us this kind of object. Um, and then we have enrichment, uh, which uh, I will skip because uh, we, I'm out of time. Uh, but essentially we, the way we construct uh, the way our construction work is based on this biset enriched category C, right? So it's an enriched category. So the object of C is the same object as Q and N. And we also assume the objects of Q and objects of N to be the same. Uh, and, then, and then the home objects of this enriched category C, which for example is CAB, is, is actually a biset, namely it's given by this interpretation of uh, functor J from MAB to QAB. So, so, so our construction is really based on this biset enrichment. Uh, and then we, uh, so this category C in a way captured both the idea of a quantum circuit and allow us to know how to run the quantum circuit at the same time. So a global morphism from A to B uh, essentially has two parts. Uh, it it, it gives us a, a circuit and an operation that corresponds to the circuit. 
And because this C by itself is more monoidal closed, we have to do some further construction like uh, UNIDA embedding and other more advanced things on, on this C. So uh, I will skip the detail, but uh, the, uh, the idea is that UNIDA embedding is very nice and it almost works, but in the end it does not because uh, because we have we have to require dynamic lifting to satisfy this diagram, but for this diagram to Camille's somehow Yoneda embedding, it surprisingly it does not preserve co-product. So we actually do not have this community diagram. So we have to resort to a more complicated construction that take the subcategory of a Yoneda embedding to make uh, to make this diagram Camille. So uh, that's that's roughly the 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 story about the categorical construction. So yeah, so I want to wrap up. So uh, yeah, I I talk about uh, the Thai system for dynamic lifting using the modality. Uh, I also briefly talk about uh, what do we mean by having a categorical model for dynamic lifting. And lastly, I I just briefly talk about the, how we construct a model for for the actual concrete model for the dynamic lifting. So yes, uh, with that, I should conclude my talk, thanks. Hey, thank you very much. Any further questions from Brian? Oops. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Could, could you maybe just say what T is now that models dynamic lifting? I think I've seen it somewhere, but uh, maybe you could remind us. So maybe in words, what is what does T do? The the monad that models dynamic lifting. You had a you had a T which which just contracted these bisets to ordinary sets. Is that the same T you're thinking of, or was it? Oh yeah, yeah. So uh yeah, so the T yeah, they are not exactly the same T. Um so for example, yeah, so but 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 essentially, in the biset, we we have this monad T that contracts two sets into one, essentially, and then and then this this mo so this is this T is the monad on the biset, right? But but the nice thing is that when we do the Yoneda embedding, this T can be lifted to the functor category, so we we can have another T which we call T bar over the functor, so, so by functor, I mean a functor from C of to V, where this V is the category of biset. And then, and then this monad T bar is constructed via this monad T, right? So, so here F is a functor from C of to V, and then we post compose it with T from V to V. So at least it type checks in some sense, but, uh, but yeah, so, so, so that's what this, so this T bar is in some sense is, is the monad for dynamic lifting. So it, it essentially means that it takes a morphism of circuits and it, it map it to, uh, to the category where we know how to run the circuit. So that's, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's roughly what this monad is doing. It's yeah. So for example, a closely monad, I mean the closely category of 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 this monad will will mean that a morphism in this this closely category actually is correspond to an operation that correspond to how we run the quantum circuit. Um yeah. I I yeah it's it's yeah I'm not sure how much sense does this make, <laughs> but uh yeah that's that's my answer right now. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, I have a question. Um, oh, I can. You go first. Uh, sure. So the category M that you start with, if I'm understanding right, is um it's something built out of circuits, like the morphisms are actual gates, circuits yeah. and gates. Is it possible to construct a model where 
it's more like vector spaces and linear maps? Is there some way to fit dynamic lifting into something like that? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, um, right? Because uh, it, it might be possible. Um, so, so in our work, we only give one model that uh, give one construction that, uh, that uh, allow us to model dynamic lifting, but it doesn't mean that this is the only construction, right? Maybe, maybe there are other construction that also give rise to a monad that satisfy those property that I described. So uh, it might be possible, I think, but I, I don't really know the answer. It is something worth to investigating, I think. Sure, thanks. Did you do it? Any other questions? Um, okay. Oh, no, okay. Oh, Sachin, go. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Who okay. is talking? So, oh, Sachin, I'm in the virtual oh. audience. Um, yeah, so you, you had a statement. You said that dynamical lifting uh, allows you to access a larger class of algorithms. Um, so what's, yeah, so... What's a, an example of an algorithm that you can only do with dynamical lifting? Right. Um, so, so one example is uh, is what they call uh, repeat until success. So it's some kind. It's a kind of algorithm that first perform a quantum circuit and then and then measure the result and based on the results of the measurement that will. Uh, that will perform further uh, application, but uh, let me let me see if I can uh, show you the code for that. Uh, right. So so here would be would be an example of uh, where we need dynamic lifting to to describe this kind of algorithm. So here V three is like a quantum gauge or from qubits to qubit, essentially, but here I add in some natural number that keep track of the some other information. But the idea is that this case is implemented in a way that feature the use of dynamic lifting. So we first apply a bunch of gates and then we measure parts of the state in this case, which is a a one, right? But whereas we still have the rest of the states we still maintain the rest of the stage, which for example, A2. So here we measure A1 and then we we use the results of the A, this measurement and further perform further processing. Like if, if it's true, then we do something else. We do some other things. And then we do this in a way that sort of recursively. So there might be multiple wrong that we need to run this uh, computation in order to terminate, but uh, but this kind of algorithm is called uh, repeat uh, until success uh, algorithm. So uh, we you you kind of need dynamic lifting in order to program this kind of algorithm. They do not correspond to a static circuit. Oh, okay, yeah, thank you. Interesting. Thank you very nice. Okay, any other questions? If not, let's thank Frank again for the very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.